Okay, so um, our next panel is on waste, and um, it will be moderated by my colleague, Katie Kearns, who's in the classics department and who is an archaeologist. And um, we've been emphasizing the ways in which um, SIGU is um, very much motivated by the, the urgent need to respond intellectually, theoretically, and pe pedagogically to contemporary climate crises, but we want to do that in ways that also fundamentally engage with the kind of long-term histories and geographies of socio-environmental transformation. And in that sense, it's absolutely wonderful to have several, at this point, archaeologists involved um, in SIGU, including Mernou Sarouche, you identify as an archaeologist, no, a landscape archaeologist, and Katie Kearns. So I'll turn it over to Katie. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So it is my pleasure to moderate our fourth panel for today, which offers three papers on the question of waste from perspectives in geography, political economy, and literature, and especially to claiming or reclaiming it as an analytical approach to environmental emergencies or emergent environments. So as an archaeologist, you could kind of say flippantly that my field is about waste. We find people's trash from the past. Um, but we kind of use it euphemistically. We use terms like refuse or discard or rubbish or um, ruins or decay. And one of the things I'm particularly excited about for this panel are the contributions to, as Pauline is going to offer, a new lexicon for the sort of semantic complexities of waste. Um, basically to open up approaches to critical historiographical and geographical modes of waste making and unmaking, as our colleague Sarah Newman's new book is going to um, talk about. Um, in light of what seems a part of our human condition to make waste invisible, to externalize it, to push it elsewhere, to distance ourselves from it, our speakers, who are all experts on the matters of waste, are going to present ways of pausing to question what waste is, how to discern it, why it's critical to studying our past, contemporary, and future conditions, how it is constructed materially and ideationally, how it emerges in opposition to concepts like value, health, civility, and changes meaning in diverse historical contexts, how it abuts and generates new and future anxieties about our own limits. How do we measure or map waste in a world of planned obsolescence and profligate consumerism? What kinds of waste might we think of as needing to be reclaimed? Arguably, it is becoming harder to reify waste in a world of residual carbon dioxide, microplastics, or oil spills. And so waste offers, I think, an especially compelling SIGU lens to some of the issues that we've been discussing today. So I'm going to now introduce our speakers. Vinay Gidwani, Distinguished University Teaching Professor of Geography and Global Studies at the University of Minnesota. His research interests include agroecological and urban transformations, labor geographies, informal economies, social reproduction, and waste. In addition to work appearing in journals like Antipode, Feminist Studies, and the Journal of Peasant Studies, he is the author of Capital Interrupted, Agrarian Development and the Politics of Work in India. And his recent work has explored speculative urbanism and the spatial history of waste in Silampur, India. Next, we'll have Pauline Gould, Assistant Professor of Romance Languages and particularly French Literature here at the University of Chicago. Her research interests include sustainability, urban garbage, and early modern ecofeminism. And she has edited Early Modern Ecologie and has published a number of articles on environmental criticism in the early modern period. She's at work on her first book project, Ecologies of Waste, Sustainability, Literature, and the New World in Renaissance France. And finally, Josh Leposky is professor of geography at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. He works on the geographies of discards, of maintenance, and of repair. He is the author of Reassembling Rubbish, Worlding Electronic Waste, as well as numerous pieces on repair, discard, e-waste, and the Anthropocene in venues like the Journal of Industrial Ecology, Geoforum, Area, and Techniques and Culture. So we're going to start with Dine. Take it away. Well, thank you very much for that generous introduction and for the summary of the panel. I'm really grateful to be here, and thanks to Neil Brenner and the other organizers for inviting me. Um, the engagements and the insights here have, have really kind of stretched my intellectual horizons in, in terrific and sometimes painful ways over the last day and a half, and there is a lot, lot to mull. So in the spirit of the conference title, um, but 
title of the panel, Reclaiming Waste, um, I want to try and reclaim waste both in the ideational register and the material register, acknowledging that, of course, the two are linked. So waste is a fraught, unstable concept. It can be potential or threat. It's recuperable sometimes into the domain of property and value, but also often leaky and non-recuperable. Waste entails a seeing from a certain social or geo-epistemic location. It also entails an unseeing that flattens heterogeneity. It's a concept with moral, economic, and affective force that participates in the world and transforms the material and social relations we inhabit. So the first part of my talk is really kind of a chaotic quest to travel with waste across time and space. And after that, I'm going to jump a few centuries into the contemporary moment. So scene one, historical enclosures, waste as external frontier. Many of you here in this room are no doubt um, aware of John Locke's two treatises of government, particularly his famous chapter of property, which is taught quite often in college settings. As several scholars, including myself, have noted, the idea of waste is prominent in this chapter, performing an elemental moral and, elemental, moral and political function. America, with its ostensibly limitless expanse of waste, becomes the origin story for the birth of private property. The subjugation of commons as idle waste sanctions settler conquest. Locke's theory unsees prior claims of indigenous inhabitants, unable to concede that the uncultivated lands might be in active uses that depart from the Eurocentric agrarian imagination which organizes his empirical seeing. On what grounds does Locke justify the dispossession of these native lands? Waste becomes the alibi, and, the, and theoretical humanism, the instrument by which Locke is able to provide an escape hatch from his allegiance to natural rights doctrine. He's a natural rights philosopher. He inserts into his story the figure of an ideal man, and suffice to say, it is man. And who is this ideal man? He is the rational individual who employs his God-given powers of reason to bring wastelands into productive uses and the resulting use values then into the realm of commerce. Money also figures quite prominently in Locke's account. Thus, Locke's theoretical humanism begins with a universal claim Everyone has the God-given powers of reason. Everyone can labor. Everyone can establish possession, which he then modifies with a particular claim. Only some Anglo settlers, men, are able to fully utilize their power of reason, be industrious, make idle lands productive, and accumulate wealth. I could say more about the idea of waste in Locke's chapter. Suffice to note that this idea of waste must not be grasped in isolation, but rather as part of a constellation of mutually reinforcing concepts. Thus, if waste is one watchword that sanctions liberalism's illiberal undertakings, improvement, as Raymond Williams has pointed out, is another. Locke's theory of property sits within the wider 17th century discourse of improvement evoked in publications such as Gervais Markham's The English Husbandman, Husbandsman, Walter Blitz's The English Improver, Andrew Yarrington's The Improver Improved, and John Smith's England's Improvement Revived. Collectively, such scenes in, in, enact, enact a seeing as well as a scene where forms of land use and labor that diverge from the normative ideals of husbandry are not only viewed as waste, but also as receptacles of disorder that sustain idle, unruly masses. 
the moral, the economic, and the aesthetic are joined within an agrarian ideology of improvement. So John Clark, who is a land agent from Herefordshire, offers a typical assessment in his 1794 account. He says, the farmers in this county are often at loss for laborers. The enclosure of the wastes would increase the number of hands for labor by removing the means of subsisting in idleness. As Mark Nucleos, the political theorist, observes, quote, enclosure would therefore provide employment for idle people, mastering the masterless men without obedience or discipline. Wasted land, wasted labor, and wasted time went hand in hand. Now, John Clark was writing in 1794, far afield in India, agents of the East India Company were busy implementing land settlements which sought to improve the company's finances by assigning property titles to estate owners and tax collectors who they hoped might be incentivized by a fixed land tax regime to become frugal, thrifty, and productive and bring the vast tracts that company officials saw as lying waste into cultivation. In the debates that preceded the famous permanent settlement of 1793 in India and after, the trope of waste came to dramatize the biocultural difference slash distance that separated Europe and Europeans from India and Indians. In her meticulous study of wastelands in the 19th and early 20th century of in, in Indian Punjab, Minoti Chakravarti Kaul notes that colonial administrators treated these, quote, simply as surplus land available for cultivation, blithely overlooking their numerous uses and the highly complex and varied institutions of communal control over what was classified as waste. So reiterate a simple, even banal point is that seeing also involves an unseeing. And waste, as I've indicated, operates in alliance with a constellation of affine concepts, improvement, industry, idleness, indolence, in composing a discourse that sees the world in a certain manner, asks questions about the state of that world in a certain manner, attributes causality in a certain manner, and acts to alter that world it sees in a certain manner. And the seeing that gives warrant to enclosures in the metropole or land settlements in the colonies tendentiously then flattens the heterogeneity of lands and uses into this amorphous category of waste. Oops, sorry. So Locke employs the concept of waste. Adam Smith travels with the concept of waste and further morphs it Taking it, taking it away from the material register of lands, wastelands, to thinking about how capital also can be wasted. So in his 1776 inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, he laments how the effects of a high 9 to 10% interest rate is apt to crowd out, he calls it sober, individuals from borrowing, instead favoring prodigals and projectors. And I, Imagine he means speculators who are apt to, quote, waste and destroy a country's capital. In short, waste appears as the dialectical and abject other of value within Smith's mercantilism, and as commercial capital paves the way for industrial capital, and as these entwined forms of capital then reshape the world for profit, the earth comes to be seen ever more as terra economica, or as Jesse Goldstein aptly puts it, quote, a landscape of wasted potential in which all of the world is potentially or not yet capital. Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher, is a hugely formative figure for British jurisprudence, also employs the concept of waste to advocate for his policies. 
in his tracks on poor laws and pauper management, originally written in 1796, he champions proposals to establish domestic and settler colonies that would, quote, solve pauperism in wasteland and agrarian labor while yielding economic and ethical benefits to society. I can speak more about Bentham's proposals in Q&A if you are interested, but for the time being, I'm going to jump a few centuries into the contemporary register. So as waste multiplies in seeing and imagination, it also multiplies in physical quantity as capitalized capitalism revolutionizes the global extraction, production, exchange, and consumption of commodities. This new epoch of untrammeled accumulation forever alters human and non-human life through a strategy of what Raj Patel and Jason Moore have called cheapness, right? Enormously, the enormously destructive consequences of this world ecology involve cheap nature, cheap money, cheap work, cheap care, cheap food, cheap energy, and cheap lives, all stoking the furnace of capital, scorching bodies, communities, and ecosystems, and leading the, leaving the world awash in co commodity ex excreta. This detritus, of course, then, becomes the source of intricate livelihood for millions, right? And with a shout out to Max Agel, who this morning um, spoke about the semi-proletarian um, classes, Henry Bernstein has talked about classes of labor as really the new mode of existence for the working classes in countries like India, where people have to pursue reproduction right, through insecure and oppressive wage employment and a range of likewise precarious informal sector activities. They don't neatly inhabit any one class position. These are just some migration routes that I extracted from the government in, of India's economic survey um, based on Indian railway data. And here's a really interesting pie chart. Focus on the green, which is the number of self-employed workers. Focus on the blue, that's the proportion of workers who have what we might call formal, regular wage employment, secure work, right, in countries like India. This is a story that is really kind of multiplied manifold in countries like Egypt, Brazil, Philippines, Thailand, you name it. At least 1% of in urban India's population, possibly more, um, or about five million people find in, informal employment in waste-related activities. And here's a typical kind of um, value chain or food chain for waste, um, and it's often represented as a pyramid, uh, but basically uh, waste pickers who gather um, and sift through garbage in search of salvage inhabit the bottom. It um, flows up the value chain um, until it is uh, recycled back into the commodity economy. In Delhi particularly, um, the, this waste economy, particularly centered around urban garbage, uh, was dominated by a particular caste group, the Balmikis, who are uh, a Dalit group, um, who were recruited by uh, British colonial officials in the late 19th century from um, states of Punjab and Haryana to come and work uh, in the sanitation sector. More recently, over the past 20 years, Muslim migrants from Bengal have now become the majority in the lower rungs, uh, the waste picking uh, rungs of North India's urban waste economies. And this is just a brief kind of, it's a waste picker settlement in Northwest Delhi. Um, the collection routes of waste pickers um, pivot um, in, in, in all kinds of essential ways around their places of de dwelling. And these informal economies are highly organized. They're also highly territorialized in terms of these routes, right? I'm just going to give you a few instances of um, where waste pickers um, find sources of um, salvage. Uh, this is a municipal bin that is owned by the city right next to a railway line which has historically served as an urban quasi-commons for waste pickers. This is 
Ghazipur, which is the largest landfill in uh, Delhi, which supports uh, a, a diverse community of waste pickers who forage on the landfill in search of salvage. Waste pickers have a, an extremely attuned, highly attuned sense of uh, place. Um, there's a, um, a way in which um, they uh, really come to uh, sense places uh, for as, as places that are hostile, but places also that might be more receptive to the work that they do. And through their work, they transform what is amorphous garbage waste uh, into uh, scrap, uh, scrap of uh, uh, various kinds, and it's a daily ordeal, right? Scrap dealers who are slightly uh, above in the food chain um, are vital nodes in this inf informal economy, and waste pickers are often tied to them um, in, through patron-client relations, just as, for instance, agricultural tenants or workers in agri agrarian settings may be tied to landowners through patron-client relations. Here's um, a worker operating a machine press for dry paper waste in a warehouse. Madanpur Khadar is one of these waste hubs that really kind of serves as a lymphatic system for the city, um, inoculating, if you want, uh, the waste, the detritus that is, the, that is accumulated in the city. Um, these, this is part of the informal uh, waste chain, a where, warehouse owners uh, storing uh, aggregated uh, waste streams in, in alleyways um, or uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes these uh, warehouses can be uh, big time with regional supply and demand networks. But what's also interesting, because I'm also a labor geographer, is uh, often the virtuosity that expresses itself even in um, what we might consider uh, work that is uh, banal, but it's anything but banal. Um, waste pickers really have to harness a, an entire sensory apparatus in which the ocular is in some ways uh, the least important. Uh, they use smell, they use touch, they, use, they, they bite uh, in order to quickly sort waste. And this is Gupta Kalakar. Kalakar, the word Hindi means artist. Um, he's an artist because he really has achieved artistry in the sorting of waste, how quickly and into how many different streams he's able to sort this waste. Here are some examples of waste um, streams, and there are you know, anywhere uh, between, um, most, most waste pickers are able to sort waste into at least 40 or 50 different streams. Some of them, like Gupta Kalakar, can sort them into 150 different streams. Scrap paper, plastics, also of many different kinds, as you can see in these troughs, auto trash, old ores, scrap metal, and hides. And as you probably now recognize, many of these um, different waste streams are in fact territorialized by different caste groups. Um, so there is an urban segmentation, a caste segmentation of, of labor in these um, situations. And here's a recent work that I've done um, in Old Silampur, which is one of um, India's largest uh, e-waste markets in, in Delhi. Waste pickers and people generally involved in these different uh, informal waste economies are often stigmatized. Um, I've termed them infrastructural labor, using the prefix infra to connote both the fact that they are invisibilized, but at the same time indispensable to the vitality of uh, cities, making it amenable for the reproduction of capital and um, the lives of residents. Waste, wa waste workers provide um, large economic and ecological subsidies to cities, and this is one um, example of uh, by, by a colleague in, in Pune who has estimated that uh, waste pickers contribute uh, $5 worth of free labor to the municipal corporation of the city every month. Waste economies are entangled in deep ways. They're semi-autonomous, but they're entangled with state and formal corporate actors in all kinds of ways, um, often through uh, forms of rent-seeking. In 2016, this informal waste economy was struck with a double whammy. The first was um, the Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi's um, launch of what he called the Swachh Bharat Mission. Uh, which is the Clean India campaign, uh, in combination with uh, rules that were then issued by the Ministry of Environment and Forests called the Solid Waste Management Rules of 2016. 
And these really kind of set up a, a, a new kind of regime, which was uh, a regime of formalization um, in which uh, there was firstly a cognitive shift among uh, municipal corporations that came to view uh, waste as an income generating asset, um, sparking privatizing enclosures of what were previously at least quasi commons or de facto commons. Uh, there was a fetish of machines in many of these uh, proposals. Uh, but a technological fix alone could not suffice. So municipalities and private operators figured out that they had to continue to rely on waste pickers, on their labor capacities, and their finely tuned sensory apparatuses, their experiential knowledge to segregate waste efficiently for profit. And whereas waste pickers earlier right, were petty commodity producers engaged in what we might call Chayanovian self-exploitation. They now became integrated as part of formalization into relations of what we would call Marxian exploitation. Excluded waste pickers, so it was just a minority that was in in integrated, and that's the word that's used. Um, the excluded waste pickers face greater precarity, and women workers among these particularly now confront a heavier double burden of productive and reproductive work. This, not surprisingly, was informed right, by a geo-epistemology of privatization, a, uh, a, a, a report, a World Bank report by Sandra Contra Levine, um, which really kind of laid out the uh, ground, grounds for uh, the privatization of municipal solid waste in cities across the global south. And this has resulted in new enclosures where waste, uh, sources of waste that were previously sort of de facto commons have now been uh, privatized and private operators are able to charge waste pickers who need waste as their means of production for uh, rents in order to access it. And a waste picker's analysis, uh, this is just one. There are many examples. Slowly, he says, we're being forced into a form of indentured labor because essentially they now have to pay um, either money rents or labor rents in terms of unpaid labor in order to access the waste that they could previously freely access. And this, all of this has really resulted in what um, my uh, current PhD student Harsha Anantraman and I have called a regime of informal subsumption, which really sort of calls into uh, place a rent exploitation complex that exists along a particular spectrum. And so, to bring this to a conclusion, a speculative upshot in the spirit of the dialectic, the waste value dialectic. Um, I can go into this more, but, <laughs> right? Um, Neil wanted Marx, he has Marx. And, um, you know, all I will say, right, in conclusion is simply that, um, right, that um, the, the detritus, right, is not going away, and neither is the need for employment, and I really sort of stress employment, because youth unemployment in places like India is, runs upward of you know, 40%. Um, we inhabit an era uh, where to invoke categories first introduced by the sociologist Robert Redfield, the great tradition of our day, which is corporate capital, is seeking new frontiers to cannibalize the little traditions of petty commodity production. Um, and non-corporate capital. So it's crucial, in my view, to side with the little traditions in finding answers to our waste crisis. Not because the little traditions are inevitably more benign, I'm not romanticizing this, but because they create jobs, skills, and livelihoods, and deploy imagination and ingenuity in so doing far more effectively than corporate capital is able to do. So the economic and political challenge, in my view, is how these little traditions can be supported to create safer, less exploitative, and more stable forms of employment. There are plenty of experiments, cooperative experiments, trade unionism, forms of trade unionism around the world that show how this detritus can be handled through cooperative forms of labor and ownership that are mutually beneficial to communities that engage in waste work as well as cities that depend for care and repair on this vital labor. And thank you for your patience.
pull this up. Thank you, Vinay. So Pauline is next, and maybe I'll put Thank you. just my own timer on to keep us on track. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try. Is it working? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to advertise some more um, our colleague Sarah Newman's upcoming book, Unmaking Waste. Um, in a way, she could have been here in my place uh, at this panel, and you would have gotten some really, really completed um, and thorough research. Um, and instead, you're going to get kind of a draft of my book project. So I hope you're happy about that. <laughs> so just start the display here. Um, so there are a few things that uh, need to be clarified uh, first, and I'm going to go way before Locke, kind of the century before, so I hope you're ready. Um, and I also risk putting everyone, you know, at sleep after lunch uh, with something as exciting as a lexicon. Um, but the first thing to be clarified is why would a lexicon be an interesting topic in a conference like this one? Um, and what am I even trying to accomplish with it? And I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but I'll let the, the talk answer for itself, hopefully. Um, and the second, which I'll start with, is what do I mean by the end of abundance? Um, and in which context um, I'm speaking of. So in late August of 2022, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, I don't need to introduce him, declared at the inaugural, that is after the summer vacation, uh, council of his government and in front of, as you can see, a gilded palace background, that we are living the end of abundance, claiming that we are living through what he calls uh, a great turn or turn around. He used the word bascule, which is this object uh, for weighing uh, things. Um, or another word he proposed, a great disruption. There were strategic choices behind his statement or word choice, including uh, piecemeal, the war in Ukraine, and the then upcoming energy crisis, his own opportunistic move toward austerity, the cuts in long-established social rights that have resulted in the recent protests and strikes that I'm sure you've heard of, and a painful summer of non-stop heat waves, the deadliest since 2003, and I should say probably his main uh, point or what he wanted to claim was actually that this was about that summer, those summer heat waves um, and the ecological aspect of things. Um, one could ask, among other things, what this abundance that he speaks of, of even was, what it looked like and when it started. And this would obviously, or though it, maybe it's only obvious for me and a few people in the room, uh, be where the French Renaissance, so the 16th century, uh, the period or cultural movement that arguably created abundance as a political image, comes in. Uh, perhaps, however, in less obvious ways, the circulation of images of abundance was always already problematic. Um, and I love to use this image of Le Corbusier, Radiant City, where he says, um, waste, I am not outraged because these things are bought, but I'm deeply distressed to see authority remaining indifferent in the face of such sacrilege, the time lost in manufacturing these tomfooleries, a healthy, aware, strong nation ought to say enough. Um, so the next slide can show you that indeed even these types of tomfooleries originated um, in the French Renaissance. This is uh, an excerpt uh, from Rebecca Zorak's book, who is an art historian, and there are two drinking bowls with lids, uh, but you can see, I'm sure, the resemblance between these. So what if in the French Renaissance there had not been abundance, but instead waste? What if this trope of both Renaissance texts and scholarship on Renaissance texts, the rhetorical abundance, the accumulation, the inexhaustibility, had not been so much an exhilarated response to a prosperous time in the history of France, the same trope that Macron himself invoked when he renamed his own party Renaissance recently, but instead a cunning early modern critique of unsustainable appetites of, in the words of Julia Livingston, cited um, here uh, a few weeks ago by Jennifer Wenzel, self-devouring growth. In my view, literary French texts carefully, although perhaps not consciously, I'll admit to that, construct a lexicon to think through sustainability and environmental impact through the phenomenon of waste. This is not as simple as claiming that these words show up in texts and retracing their history and etymology. Rather, I claim that there is a crystallization around the phenomenon of waste in the French Renaissance of a series of anxieties about sustainability, not unlike, in fact, Le Corbusier in his day. Um, so waste is usually conceived of, I think we would agree to it in this room and in this table, uh, an object, 
especially but not only within the realm of waste studies, and it would be necessary to explain what sort of object it even is uh, in Renaissance France. I once had the question at a first year writing seminar from one of the students of what does garbage look like in the 16th century, which was a very good question, but I had never thought of it. Uh, when Rebecca Zorak claims that uh, Fontainebleau, King the King Francis I's castle is less wasteful than modern consumer lifestyles, she draws a powerful parallel between what I see as two phenomena, or perhaps a similar phenomenon, rather than an object. Waste and consumerism, on the one hand, but also the luxurious and conspicuous consumption of the 1%, as opposed to some unnamed other. There's also an opposition in her statement that this 1% in the Renaissance, hoarding wealth in the display of power that multiplies into artistic and architectural representations, once it is compared to the consumer lifestyles of most people in developed countries today, is paradoxically less wasteful. The implication, which draws on a conceptual rather than data-driven deduction, is that technological advances and inventions have made us individually waste more than the king and his court probably did at the time. Um, yet ours is a wastefulness of planned obsolescence, semiconductors, and fast fashion. Theirs was um, castles, decor, imagined natural abundance. This is details from the gallery from the previous slide. And distance new resources. Uh, this is corn. So we're in uh, about 15... Um, 30s, I think, at that time, and already you see corn in the visual imaginary, imaginary uh, of, um, of France. These seem completely different, and yet the phenomenon is so pervasive that in 1580, uh, around 1580, Michel de Montaigne, known for his condemnation of the conquest of the New World and cultural relativism um, in the essay of Cannibals, brags in another essay that it is no small feat to find oneself preserved or safe from the contagion of such a wasted century. And if you can see the, the or French original, the word is actually gasté, so it's the etymological origin for waste. He uses the verb for wasting uh, in early modern French, gâter, a direct origin of the English verb. I don't think he meant strictly the kind of waste I described or we're talking about at this table today. The beauty of the phrase is that it fits into intermingled phenomena left open to our interpretation. His could be a moral admonition that Montaigne does not like the direction that things are going. I have reasons to think, in fact, that the moral, human, or humanist, you could say, dimension is intricately tied up with an environmental one. Um, this is, sorry, the, um, the Codgrave Dictionary from the French into English, and then um, lexically, waste has complex origins that span from emptiness, so the field, the wasteland, in fact, to fullness and excess uh, in modernity. In order to squander, one has to have reserves. In order to spoil, the most direct translation of the old French, gâté, one has to have more than merely the strict minimum. Etymologically, back to the Latin wastare up in the slide, which gave us devastation, waste is also clearly tied to the idea of wars, of expansion, and of conquest. The phenomenon of waste, then, in the Renaissance might be, historically, the consequence of the discovery um, and conquest of the New World. From the start, it would be a simplistic misinterpretation to remain in a scholarly status quo that, for the explorers and the conquistadores, the new continent signified more resources, the natural abundance painted on the walls of Fontainebleau's gallery. Even in the chronicles of Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, we find a clear perception of the staggering abundance, and I'm using commas here, of Peru as an almost monstrous, uncontrollable phenomenon as the Valle de la Yerba Buena, a valley where the plants that Spaniards tried to cultivate become so fruitful that they transform into weeds. At a time where famines were still rampant, how could clear-cut abundance like this one be represented or imagined as actually ambivalent? Uh, the next word in the lexicon is sustainability. The thing about Renaissance France, the specificity of my corpus, is that it is geographically a moment of disorientation, processing, like most of Europe, the so-called discovery, again, of the new world as it becomes a continent, a terra firme, instead of just some islands. Um, so this is a map from the Dauphin Atlas um, with a beautiful 
uh, representation of Brazil. It's not very well known at all, and I just learned about it. But it's disoriented because, as you can see, Brazil is up to the to the right. What makes it interesting is that France's engagement with the New World is almost entirely, albeit accidentally, speculative. It is through texts, um, so sorry, yeah, travel narratives, um, and this is a sweet potato, by the way. <laughs> um, manuscript maps. Um, obtained from Portuguese sources, uh, mostly. This is the Miller Atlas that you already saw this morning. Uh, eyewitness narratives that the learned culture negotiates the epistemological shift. Um, France was cut off from New World ambitions. Sorry, just go back. France was cut off from New World ambitions because of the treaties of Tordesillas, so only Spain and Portugal were able to grab uh, the Americas, as you know, but also because of its own civil wars, um, the wars of religion. As far as I can tell, this is the specificity that in Renaissance France, waste as a phenomenon seems to have something to do with how authors perceive the discovery and then the conquest and then the devastation of the new world. It is perhaps a chicken or the egg situation. So we don't know which one started the other in a way. The result, however, is that a series of reflections on how unsustainable the status quo of unstoppable waste is. In several texts that I study, waste show the necessary and pervasive complication at the time of the relationship between art and nature. What we take from nature to make art, in terms of exhaustion of the necessary resources and in terms of the superfluity of art itself, the vanity of most unnatural things. Meanwhile, the travel narratives in the New World struggle to convey an abundance that would easily translate into the profitability of the conquest, with pineapples that rot on the way to France and indigenous voices exemplifying more sustainable way to live. Um, this is another term of the lexicon. Sustainability, of course, does not exist at the time, and especially not as a noun. The century may not then have the necessary vocabulary to talk about, and I'm just using the Oxford English Dictionary uh, definition of sustainability, the degree to which a process is able to be maintained or continued while avoiding the long-term depletion of natural resources. In very significant ways, however, texts represent the fear of depletion, concerns about the durability of natural resources, and most of all, anxieties around what the new overwhelming sense of gâté, of waste, the luxury at the top, the proliferation of appetites and needs that seem new and superfluous signifies for the future. Um, and this is a, a quote from Montaigne of Cannibals uh, that I'll read, but as you can see, what I'm interested in is the representation of actual appetites as you're talking about how to grasp uh, the immensity of the new world. This discovery of an infinite country seems worthy of consideration. I don't know if I can guarantee that some other such discovery will not be made in the future, so many personages greater than ourselves having been mistaken about this one. I'm afraid we have eyes bigger than our stomachs and more curiosity than capacity. We embrace everything, but we clasp only wind. Um, in um, another uh, crucial passage of Montaigne's other essay on the new world of coaches, he repeats um, the verb soutenir, so sustain in French, in what I argue is a prefiguration of the meaning we ascribe of the root today or to the root today. Um, he clearly speaks of the European impact of the New World, but also consequently of the human impact on the environment as a burden placed on nature. Um, and I could speak more about this quote, but I don't really have time to go um, a lot into it. Actually, this isn't it. This is it. I'm sorry. Um, this reflection on limits might even come from indigenous sources or voices, um, as this conversation shows. So this is going to be in... Jean de Léry's conversation um, with, uh, that he reports with an elder uh, from the Tupi uh, tribe. Um, Truly, said my elder, um, I see now that you mayors, that is Frenchmen, are great fools. Must you labor so hard to cross the sea on which, as you told us, you endured so many hardships just to amass riches for your children and those who will survive you? Will not the earth that nourished you suffice to nourish them? We have parents and children whom, as you see, we love and cherish, but because we are certain, or we take care, that after our death the earth which has nourished us will nourish them, we rest easy and do not trouble ourselves further about it. The sustainability lexicon conceptualized by these authors 
involves the load or the burden, which I think is quite a modern thing in a way, um, sufficiency, um, and a temporal but also uh, affective dimension of the verb sustain, a fact that leads us to understand even better that our generation dread, and that's the recent book by Britt Ray, and climate paralysis are not modern. And that it is entirely possible that we as a species have always had issues with negotiating emotionally, ethically, morally, the negative and destructive impact we see ourselves having on the environment. Um, and the third word is um, ecologies. Um, so ecologies is a loaded word, um, and a word that is often, uh, in literary environmental criticism at least, used without much attention to defining it. Um, and I don't mean it as a, an ad hominem accusation or criticism, um, because I think it's actually quite a poetic use of the term. Um, but it's the fact that we seem to assume we know what it means. My project is titled Ecologies of Waste, but these aren't ecologies in the sense of political ecologies or in the scientific sense. They are not a synonym of ecosystems either. Instead, they go back to the logos of the oikos, so the, the logi of the echo, uh, the discourse on inhabiting, the discourse on the home, of what it means to make a home. Simply put, there are ways of looking at as well as thinking and writing about the environment. I don't think that parts of the text that I'm studying are ecological or environmental thematically, but rather that the very fabric of these texts, their form as well as their content, their genre, their tone, their metaphors, ask questions about what unsustainable situations might look like, what it means to reach environmental impasse, uh, what caring for a sustainable future would even imply. This means that something prompted such questions to become the propulsive force behind some of the most canonical texts of Renaissance France, including one that prefigured postcolonialism, Shakespeare's Tempest, um, and one that, in Claude Lévi-Strauss's opinion, was the first model of an ethnographic monograph. So for the former, I'm speaking about of cannibals, which uh, it, it's, it has been proven that Shakespeare uh, uh, read it before writing The Tempest. Um, and then uh, the, the latter is uh, Léry. One could easily dismiss this or attribute it simply to the discovery of the new world in epistemological terms. These ecologies, however, are intrinsically tied up to a care for the limitedness of natural resources and for the violence of the conquest. So they are ecologies of waste because waste as an environmental phenomenon translates into concerns, cares, and anxieties about the future. When I present this project, I'm occasionally asked what the author's proposals might be, which I think goes to show that ecologies as a word will always have the implication of a project, a plan, or some sort of fix, something positive at least and proactive. Instead, these ecologies are anxious and ambivalent, or even delimited uh, by negatives. In my corpus, for instance, there's a story of a counter example of resource dilapidation in record time that brings to an impasse. There's a fable of how human beings invented war at the same time as they invented surplus production of grain. There's uh, an indigenous wise man admonishing the European's way of life, which I already cited. These ecologies are also early modern, which paradoxically means eerily modern, but also not modern yet, or quite yet. At the last minute, let me add another word to the lexicon, which is anxiety. Faced with the limits of abundance at a time that pretended to have reached peak abundance, these texts cannot be said to offer any kind of reassurance. Perhaps they are impasses themselves. Perhaps they are just like these archaeological statues exhibited in a formal thermal power station in Rome, and we are left to draw some form of conclusion from the juxtaposition of fossil capital and of the classics. Even the thermal power station is already obsolete. And there is perhaps in the end a similar kind of vanity in the switched off machines as there is in art. In, just, in the, juxt the juxtaposition at least calls back to the fact that art in the early modern period in Montaigne's lexicon is as much artifice as it is technology. It's all superfluous in regard to nature. And this is another quote from, of Cannibals. It is not reasonable that art should win the place of honor over our great and powerful mother nature. We have so overloaded the beauty and richness of her works by our inventions that we have quite smothered her. Um, and here is clearly the, the load again, with overloaded and with the smothering. Uh, so if there is a space in Renaissance France from which to think through the complexity of sustainability, 
I would like to propose that it's from um, within a certain idea of literature developed at the time through experimentations with forms that allow ecological thinking. Ultimately, it is not um, about listing precepts from Montaigne, so his precept would be don't ruin the new world, uh, or Bernard Palissy, who is an artisan, who his precept would be think carefully about the implications of what you take from the earth, but about the fact that noblemen like the former and poor men like the latter perhaps took more seriously than we originally thought the moral and environmental risks of expansion, colonization, and growth and that they perhaps listened to indigenous voices that found their way into Protestant ideas about agriculture and into a pre-revolutionary thought, um, and I mean pre-revolutionary as in pre-1789, but also in other ways, of what we would now call environmental justice. It's about the questions they stopped and asked, uh, while everyone else, it seems, partook in the creation of Western, non-negotiable ways of life where we are now stuck, it seems. Is our own land not sufficient? When did we let excessive appetites take over? What possibilities existed for our civilization at that time that could have led elsewhere? What was lost or wasted? How do we conceive of subsistence? Who gets to consume more than the others and why? Are there perhaps other better ways to live? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I will start. Uh, as uh, all of us have by thanking um, the conference organizers. It's been uh, a massive pleasure and honor to be invited to uh, speak um, at this conference. Um, I am going to be presenting uh, work that is still very much in its early stages. Um, most of my work has been on electronics, which is a, a very loose category, um, and the waste and pollution uh, attributable to them in the mining and man all the way from the mining of materials for them through manufacturing uh, and through use. So in other words, uh, environmental impacts or, or waste impacts of electronics. What I'm working on now uh, is a project on the environmental impacts on electronics uh, production. And so <clears throat> I start with the title, Wasting Warming and the Risky Water Futures of Global Semiconductor Production. So I, I like thinking about electronics, and, and semiconductors are a, a segment thereof that I'll uh, talk about in detail in a moment. Because, at least for me, they, they remain um, very allegorical objects. They sort of, this conglomerate of plastics and metals and glasses, all plural, uh, come to stand in at once for, you know, sort of our hopes and dreams uh, of a, you know, various shiny and technological futures, but also the nightmares of environmental and social breakdown. And so for me, they are very uh, useful objects to think with. Um, and then in terms of the, the idea of waste, as, as Vinay and, and others uh, are pointing out, this is a, uh, you know, a highly capacious category. And the, part of the argument that I'm making here in this work is that um, greenhouse gases of various kinds to which electronics mining and manufacturing as well as use all contribute to is shifting from um, waste which is something that can be managed to uh, what uh, the anthropologist Mary Douglas many of you may uh, be familiar with called dirt. Uh, and the distinction that she makes between waste and dirt. Waste is something that uh, has a proper place in a system of one kind or another, whereas dirt represents a kind of existential threat. And I'm trying to work with that um, uh, idea here in some of this work. So semiconductors, as a friend and colleague of mine, Henry Jung, um, who many of you may know his work uh, in, uh, on global production networks, a, a theme of research in economic geography that uh, is very, very important. He has a brand new book out. Um, electronics are very much a sort of a pattern industry for that field of research to think about how 
uh, economies are organized geographically. And in his, his uh, most recent book, he talks about semiconductors as arguably the most critical intermediate good for ICT and products, so uh, information communication technologies and products. So things like this microphone, this laptop. Um, and uh, some precision around terms is, is important here in the image on your left. <clears throat> um, the, the semiconductors are what you see sort of in the background of that image uh, and the middle foreground. These, these um, uh, wafers of uh, silicon that have been uh, highly processed and really form, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the sort of the fundamental building blocks for the chips that you see towards the foreground of the um, uh, picture there. Now, <clears throat> as many of you may also be aware, we're hearing a lot about um, the geopolitics of supply chains, production chains uh, for uh, chips, and of course, um, this is very you know front and central, fr front and central in things like the Chips for America Act. Journalistic uh, takes on that, uh, featuring a, a chip, you know, a growing so-called chip war between the U.S. and and China, and indeed all the way through to uh, war game scenarios when the chips are down, where um, people are spending time gaming out uh, possible future scenarios for uh, geopolitical control of of. Um, they say chip production. They mean both microchips and semiconductors. Um, to link up with uh, perhaps uh, some of the work from Joe, uh, this isn't um, text mining per se, more content analysis, but when you read these uh, very lengthy books or reports, when you uh, are looking for references to climate or climate change, what you find is not abundance, but absence. And so this is very clear evidence of a particular way of um, framing these global, so, uh, global uh, projections around um, access to semiconductors, controlling productions around it, without paying attention to a variety of other um, uh, very much interconnected, intersecting um, uh, threats uh, or crises, if we, if we want to use those terms, that are nevertheless directly um, uh, important to semiconductor production. Um, and, you know, we see some evidence for uh, these kinds of concerns already, at least in, in journalistic ways. So water scarcity is um, uh, already driving um, uh, how uh, uh, wastewater is being handled in semiconductor production. Uh, the two images more on the right-hand side of the screen, the, the one above there. Uh, so in, in uh, TSMC, if you don't know, that company is, is among the most important semiconductor companies in the world, um, uh, based principally in, in Taiwan. And this is uh, from the New York Times, which is, uh, pointing out that, uh, well, first, the sort of massive quantities of water that are used in the production of semiconductors. It does say consumed. We could have a conversation about what that means in, term, in the context of semiconductor production. It's quite different than consumed in the sense of agriculture and that whole idea of virtual water. The, the water is not embedded in the semiconductors. But at the same time, you can't be using water to uh, manufacture semiconductors and be irrigating the field. The water can't be in two different places at the same time. Um, but as that top uh, article points out, uh, at least in uh, parts of uh, Taiwan, there, there is already um, choices being made between irrigating fields and uh, manufacturing semiconductors. So this is not, it might sound more like a kind of future dystopic sci-fi scenario, food or, or microchips, uh, we're already there. So part of the work that um, I'm trying to do is to think about how uh, future projected climate scenarios um, may or may not uh, impact on uh, semiconductor manufacturing. So I've taken existing publicly available data sets and um, uh, 
for, for sort of two different uh, decades or, or years, so 2030 and 2040, essentially taking three scenarios from each, an optimistic climate scenario, a business as usual climate scenario, and a pessimistic one. And then each of those categories on the left-hand side of the screen, low, low, medium, medium, high, et cetera, just refer to different categories of water scarcity that these underlying models point to. The circles are color-coded with the level of risk, so moving from blue, lower risk, to, uh, to red, deep, deep red, uh, extreme high risk. And the size of the circles represent the proportion of actually existing semiconductor manufacturing facilities uh, in each of the watersheds globally that are classified in these water scarcity risks. So let me point out a couple of patterns that I think are useful for us to think through. So one, there's, there are not massive differences between sort of the most um, uh, near-term and optimistic scenario and the most far-term um, far and uh, most pessimistic scenario. There are some differences, but not huge. So let's look across those categories, despite not there not being massive differences between those those various uh, scenarios, um, it these these climate projections for water scarcity versus the actual location of semiconductor manufacturing facilities, of which there are about fifteen hundred or so globally, um, attributable to roughly five hundred different companies. Uh, Forty percent of them are already. Uh, projected to be in extremely high uh, risk um, water scenarios or high. Indeed, if we expand that uh, to the, the medium high um, scenario, we're now looking at better than 65% of all facilities. And remember, without semiconductors, you get no other electronics. So risks at this point in the global production network or supply chain will um, uh, at least potentially, of course, cascade throughout those, those global production networks uh, in, in critical ways that may have little to do with the kind of geopolitical risks that so much of this discourse around chip wars and whatnot is, is premised. Not to take too much uh, time here, but um, semiconductor facilities are super expensive, and so they don't get built very often. Uh, that means you can actually kind of track new ones in, in real time being announced and, and constructed. So I've added to the database that's available publicly and just looked at the ones that have been announced or under construction um, since basically 2021. Um, and there are patterns we could talk about. Maybe we, I'll, I'll leave for, for questions and answers. So I've, I've mapped the actual locations of semiconductor facilities, which you see in the, the small green dots there, obviously not to scale, um, and uh, color-coded uh, the uh, watersheds at globally for their water uh, scarcity risk. And again, this is all from publicly available data. The patterns are mixed, um, but as you see, for example, in, in um, Northeast Asia, chunks of China are already large swaths, swaths of it. This is the uh, optimistic scenario um, uh, projected to be in, in the highest uh, risk for, for water scarcity, um, which is going to have uh, major you know, implications for choosing uh, what uses to which water is being put. Um, the picture is also quite mixed uh, through Europe. We, you know, of course, we, we talk about the whole process of offshoring going on from the 60s, but there's still plenty of, of semiconductor manufacturing going on uh, in Europe. Those facilities, too, um, uh, have a, you know, a very mixed picture of um, water, secure, water scarcity risk. But that has major implications for all of this um, uh, policy making around this, you know, the so-called reshoring of, of manufacturing uh, these things to supposedly avoid 
the, 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 the geopolitical risk related to having uh, manufacturing supply chains being located in, in China. Um, what, what may be possible under these future uh, climate projections for really mitigating that geopolitical risk you know, could, could be uh, more or less erased or, or wiped out by, um, for lack of a better term, environmental risk in the form of water scarcity. Um, so for all of the Chips for America Act, um, things do not look great uh, <laughs> for uh, prospects in the United States. Most of existing semiconductor production is in the desert, already in the desert south, southwest. Water scarcity and, and um, semiconductor manufacturing have been in conflict for already for decades, um, particularly in, uh, in and around places like Phoenix. Um, and so it's not, I don't want to suggest that it is a new problem, uh, but it, it uh, does not look like it will get easier uh, as these new um, climate scenarios un, uh, unfold. Um, so uh, just back to the global production networks literature in terms of thinking about what those geographic patterns might mean um, and how we might think about them. So global production networks um, as, a, as a theory um, uh, you know, look at different scales of connection. I'm somewhat agnostic about the way it, it treats uh, what it calls local versus regional versus national. I'm much more interested in the the networkiness of the global uh, production network uh, theory. So in, in Henry's work and others, um, he offers these um, sort of four explanatory variables for um, talking about how global production networks become organized, uh, geographically speaking. I'm not going to speak to all of them at, at this point, but just point our attention to what gets called risk mitigation. And um, in that work, environmental questions are bundled up under that idea of risk mitigation, but they tend to be um, and that comes in Henry's work from um, interviews with you know, very high level um, uh, IT um, executives um, you know, from, from Apple, from TSMC, et cetera, um, who, who worry about things like earthquakes and, and worry about siting their facilities where that risk can be mitigated or if they are s situated where things like earthquakes are, are problematic, how to mitigate those risks, or acute events like floods. But what is very um, acutely absent from their concerns and from, from Henry's analysis is uh, real, you know, concerns around climate change and, and again, the, these issues of uh, water scarcity. So that's part of what I'm trying to uh, develop in this work and contribute potentially at least to uh, this geographic thinking of on on global production networks. Now, why do I I uh, focus on the the networkiness of global production networks? Um, you know, there may be many in this room for whom uh, thinking about networks, uh, you're very familiar with this. I'll just use an example from uh, where I live in, in uh, Newfoundland. This is the island of Newfoundland. You know, if I were an, uh, an evil uh, Bond villain or, or just a sort of uh, standard uh, uh, military logician, I could try to control the, uh, the island of Newfoundland um, uh, in a variety of different ways, I could try to take control of its entire sort of land mass, or I could focus on the networks that connect it. And so I've taken away the land mass here and just left behind here the road networks. And I could really control the entire province by controlling really just three points. So. Um, uh, the, wherever the, the container traffic can land, there are only um, really two points on the coast that can handle standard container traffic. Sort of on the, the southeast uh, peninsula there is where the ferries land that bring our food. And then uh, on the very easterly side of the island, uh, so the furthest right, is both uh, 
the, the one other container point, uh, one international airport, which if you take control of, no more, no more seven, 747s can land. Uh, there's one other airport that can handle that kind of in the center of the island. Uh, so you take control of that. You now have control of the total landmass. So what matters is how places are connected in, in relational and in network ways rather than just their, their raw geography, as it were. And so that really matters when it comes to uh, thinking about semiconductor production. So just to take one particular example, Apple is dependent on its iPhone for about 50% uh, of its revenue. But um, the, the key uh, uh, semiconductors that go into Apple's iPhone are um, uh, made by these specific TSMC uh, plants that I've highlighted here on the map here. And so climate change risk kind of cascades through that global production network for Apple and for TSMC and for Samsung in, in different ways. Apple has convinced them to, um, them being TSMC and, and Samsung, to enter into exclusive manufacturing contracts. So they've built facilities that only supply Apple. Um, so those water scarcity risks are very different for um, TSMC and Samsung than they are for Apple. At the same time, um, electronics manufacturing and semiconductors in particular are, are quite unlike other global production networks, say for, for fast fashion or agricultural production. You cannot switch quickly as a lead firm, if you will, from you know, one supplier to another in the electronics world. Apple is deeply dependent on those, um, those supply chains and is in, in some ways, with 50% with of its revenues tied up in that one product line, um, uh, kind of uh, facing, you know, it, it, its own risks in terms of uh, future water scarcity. So for me, this um, way of thinking about um, uh, greenhouse gases as a form of, of discard that is becoming dirt, an existential threat to system, um, is uh, uh, a way to think through these empirics, and then the empirics are a way to think about what these kinds of um, global production networks mean, how they might be organized uh, differently. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we have um, maybe 15 pushing to maybe 20 minutes for questions before a small break and then the round table. And we can run this in the way that the previous panel did, where we can collect maybe three or four questions and then have the panelists jot down notes to answer them in turn. So questions. I see Marnoush here. to Josh. Um, so your point, uh, early point about um, prioritizing irrigation versus um, semiconductor production ties to what John was talking about, this inequality and environmental justice, because mm -hmm. I'm assuming the most of the use of the semiconductor is for the wealthy uh, countries with the huge amount of um, basically uh, digital mm. Uh, consumption versus versus the agriculture uh, sector is mainly probably producing cheaper kind of mass production food for um, for um, basically underdeveloped countries or the uh, the community. So I wonder how you see that that playing and is what my assumption is is correct or not mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So was there a hand up over there? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um Thanks so much for a great panel. Uh, my name is Will Conroy. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard. Um, so my question was mostly on this concept of informal subsumption that Vinay offered. I was wondering if you could kind of speak to how that concept relates to more um, uh, recognizable forms of subsumption, namely formal and real subsumption. And also, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to whether or not you think that concept travels to other historical geographical contexts and other examples of informal subsumption that you might point to. 
questions, yeah. Thanks so much um, for these, these wonderful talks. This is Helen Curry from Georgia Tech. Uh, and I'm really, um, I'm interested in thinking across the papers a little bit, and, and I was, um, uh, I liked this idea that Vinay put on the table of, of little traditions um, and, and thinking through the, 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 the potential there. Um, and thinking about this, looking back to the history of, of waste and reuse um, for, for you know, models and patterns um, that were implemented previously in, in dealing with, with waste. Um, and then this example of the semiconductor industry for which we don't necessarily have a past to look back to. And that's where the comparison to agriculture and fast fashion that, that you brought up there at the end is really interesting because those are places where we can point to, you know, agroecological um, kind of quote unquote traditional agriculture as, as a way of thinking through alternative ways of being and using resources. And that seems to just kind of fall away in the space that, that you're working in there, Josh. And so I'm, I'm interested in, well, I guess maybe this is a question for you then in a way, you know, how does, um, how does the notion of little traditions or, or, or the, the, the prior modes of, of circulation and dealing with waste then um, uh, you know, work in this example you have, or is it just a totally new paradigm? So maybe one more, yeah. And then we can have um, Billy Fleming, uh, first, just thank you so much for this panel. This was wonderful. Um, and this is maybe a question that is maybe better saved for the final panel, but so you can feel free to ignore it. But I, this one spoke most acutely to me, kind of a cross-cutting theme I've noticed across most of our discussions today, but most acutely with you all, is just this idea of like competition for space, resources, et cetera. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, it's not just residential users or business users or even heavy or excuse me, industrial agriculture in the Southwest fighting over water. It's also heavy industry. It's also mm -hmm. especially elect electricity production, mm -hmm. right? There was mm -hmm. a very real possibility that we'd have to take nuclear plants offline during the peak of the drought this summer because they rely so heavily on that water draw. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk about like waste in that context, this mm -hmm. like idea that we don't, have, we don't have the abundance of land and resources that maybe we think we do in the US mm -hmm. to deploy all the technology and all the trees and all the other things we want or need for the energy transition. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a lot of waste to deal with in addition to like sorting out where all of that shit goes. <laughs> um, and we're probably not gonna do what Iceland did, right? Which is you know a much longer story about the abundance of geothermal power, the attraction of industrial scale aluminum smelting, and then the use of wastewater to make fancy lagoons that people like me like to sit in. Um, <laughs> so we're probably not to do that, although maybe we will. I just wonder if you could talk a bit about um, where the reuse or redirection or, or other sort of futures for waste and discard material kind of fits knowing how much competition for land and resources and other things are coming. So maybe we can um, have people respond and then we'll see if we have time for more questions. Vinay, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you, Will, for that question about informal subsumption. So it's an idea that uh, my student Harsha and I are still developing. But um, just to differentiate it very quickly from formal and in, in, real subsumption, which are the typical categories that we deal with, formal subsumption, where in some ways capital dominates but hasn't necessarily um, divorced uh, workers from their means of production and real subsumption where workers in some ways are entirely dependent upon capital for their reproduction. Um, and informal subsumption in some, way, some ways uh, falls in between that uh, to the extent that uh, you asked about you know, how well these categories travel and I think there's been really interesting work by particularly labor historians who argue that this uh, binary of formal and real subsumption really kind of speaks from the Western experience and these categories are not as nimble when it comes to understanding the um, historical and contemporary situation, right, of the development of um, capitalism in, uh, let's say, the global south, right? And I say that with, with some qualifications, but um, the, the idea is that in, in some ways, um, the, the process of real subsumption per se has, has, has never really occurred 
uh, in the same manner. Um, and that's partly because uh, a proletariat in the kind of uh, imagination that informs, say, someone like Marx hasn't really been uh, produced in the same manner. And, and in fact, uh, the argument by labor historians now is that we need to kind of rethink and, and, and recognize, acknowledge that uh, workers, um, in fact, uh, inhabit what Bernstein more recently uh, has called classes of labor, which is to say that they don't necessarily inhabit one uh, clear class position, but in fact uh, end up uh, really traveling between uh, many uh, class positions simply in order to assemble uh, their livelihood. So they may be, you know, in at, at times uh, within, I guess, the field of gravity of, of, of capital and, and the accumulation economy, and other times uh, they may be uh, out of it uh, really in, in certain kinds of uh, forms of self-employment, but they may be also wage workers, uh, they may be, uh, but informal wage workers, they may be engaged in, you know, incidental marginal forms of agriculture, uh, they may be indentured. There's a whole kind of over their lifespan, uh, these many involvements uh, in, in, and so we need to really kind of reconsider this category. The, 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 the other way in which we've been thinking about informal subsumption quite aside from you know, trying to depart from this kind of uh, chronological imagination uh, that informs uh, our thinking about capitalism is to actually make the argument that uh, uh, these uh, new forms that emerge around, say, the formalization of uh, waste management, let's call it, um, are, are creating uh, really this, this kind of terrain, this topography, uh, where um, these private enterprises uh, are assetizing waste and are not only sort of uh, utilizing workers in the conventional exploitative relations, but also um, are able to extract uh, intensified uh, rents from these uh, pickers. So there is a kind of rent emergence of a rent exploitation concept. And I think the more sort of accurate term that we've been using to think about the rent exploitation complex is how informal subsumption uh, actually intensifies labor grabbing, which is in some ways the capacity of uh, workers, the time that they need for their own uh, social reproduction. So that's how we've been thinking of it and, you know, would love to chat and clarify. Um, Josh, do you want to? Uh, sure. Those were really good questions, and I, I wish I had just all the answers. Um, <laughs> um, let me start with, with your question about, um, I sort of translated that for myself as sort of questions about who gets what, under what conditions, these sorts of things. So. In the case of um, Taiwan, that, that New York Times article was fo focusing on, um, at least in that journalism, it's a focus on uh, rice farmers in Taiwan who were being paid not to grow. Um, and at, it, if I'm remembering correctly, at rates that you know were good, let's say. <laughs> um, the trade-off being the water that they would have been using for irrigation was uh, sent to the semiconductor fabrication plants elsewhere in, in Taiwan. I think that, that it raises a variety of, I think, very telling questions. Taiwan is you know, very wealthy <laughs> relative to other parts of the world. And obviously, they can afford to pay their farmers a, for want of a better word, a living wage. But where was that rice going? Was it for domestic consumption? Was it for export? Um, also, I think your question is, is really important in that the image we have is that these kinds of objects are predominantly uh, in use in the, you know, the so-called global north, but the largest market for semiconductors in the world is China. It's also the largest manufacturer of them. So um, now, of course, that comes with all sorts of uh, um, differentiations around wealth and class and all that kind of stuff. So again, it's, it's a way of into 
um, thinking about these, these very um, complex and nuanced uh, geographies rather than the, the, these kind of stark monoliths between, say, global north, global south, and so on and so forth. But yeah. Other. I don't know. I, I, I do love your question, though, because we've been doing a lot of speculation about what does it mean to not have a past to look at. Um, and I think it's a question I haven't asked myself, but that's a very good one. Um, but just to say something about the, the competition for um, space and resources and all that, I think that's what... So just as, as a background, uh, this is not to talk about me for a long time, but I, I think I was a waste scholar as a student before I was an early modernist. I was not an early modernist um, for a long time during my PhD. And then it kind of came to me that all the texts that I was looking at in a very Francophone context, um, if I really wanted to ask the questions of, of waste and of the environment in general, I really had to look at the 16th century, the texts just imposed themselves. Um, and that's what's interesting about it is that it is before um, kind of before, but at least for France, it is before um, the participation in, the, in slavery. It is before um, colonization, which happens a lot in the 17th century in France, but not much in the 16th. And before all that, you kind of have this speculation on why all this surplus, why is this all um, necessary? Where is this really all going? And it happens also parallel to what you're seeing um, in Spain, which is quite different. Um, you know, in Spain, the travel narratives, the natural histories, they're very focused on gold. Um, you know, it's gold and silver and greed, obviously because they have access to it. But in France, it's much less about gold and, and silver, which you would think it would be, uh, particularly as they were cut off from those sources of wealth. And instead, it is about what I would call um, this sense of just uh, waste and all these resources that potentially they could make into profitable crops, but it's not at that level just yet. Um, and it's just strange to me that there's this paradox that there's all these potentially new um, new land, new resources in, in the Americas at the time, but they don't seem to, there's not that positive uh, aspect that comes with it. And instead it's just more anxieties. I think that says something about um, even where we are now, in a way, I don't think I can formulate it um, particularly well. Um, but that's, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Um, we've come to the official ending time for this panel on the schedule, and we do have the round table. So I was going to suggest that maybe if you still have questions, save them for the round table after a 10 minute break. Or, Neil, I don't know what you think. Um, maybe we should decide collectively. We could do one more round of brief questions and one more round of brief responses if people would like, but it's been a long day. Mm -hmm. So it looks like Sashed has a question. I think let's collect a few okay. more, but if people sure. can try to be pretty concise, and then similarly for the panel, and then we can still. Um, also, Joe Gulby went outside to find out what the protest is. <laughs> and she just texted me that, in fact, it's a. Um, it's a divest um, you know, oh. from, from the, you know, the, the fossil endowment wow. and climate reparation. So after this round, we may need to decide whether we join the protest. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to that. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, thank you for this panel. I thought it was really put, uh, well put together. And one thing that I was thinking about as I listened to, uh, I think, Pauline um, talking after Winner it seemed like there were a diversity of perspectives uh, to think about waste in sort of Renaissance France. And I imagine whether there were a similar diversity of perspectives um, that uh, contemporaries of Locke, for example, were thinking about, which makes me wonder whether there, um, whether, whether there is something else to think about here, uh, something necessarily that might happen in the 19th century with industrial capitalist modernity, and whether that may change the um, relationship of waste and value. Um, because it seems to me that the abstractions that 19th century capitalism brings in uh, change or might, might change waste from this sort of abject other or this precondition, this um, the, uh, prevent or, or, or make, make waste not just this moment of primitive accumulation, but um, something that is uh, constantly constitutive uh, of of value, and uh, I mean, which is also just which is also to sort of question whether um, 
this waste and value uh, distinction has or, or should be given more uh, concrete historical uh, roots in a particular moment and whether then we can think about these things as enduring into the future, which is, as you suggested, something that we might have to think about with petty commodity production as, as something that might endure and, uh, well, uh, whether, whether we want to think about this waste value uh, dialectic continuing into the future or whether we imagine it ending. Sheriff, you've been waiting. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mehmet Chan Akpanar, University of Chicago and Eastern Studies. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for not wasting our time with their wonderful <laughs> <pa> papers. <laughs> uh, my question is also a similar conceptual one, especially the use of the word waste in English, in English because uh, many of the papers were kind of building upon this concept and it, what, what it semantically signifies into the, in constructing a narrative. In, uh, in German, they, have, they make a distinction between Abfall and Müll, uh, which is, Müll is more like garbage, trash, rubbish, or dirt, as you kind of brought it up. And we also, I come from Turkey, we also make this distinction, or the companies want to make the distinction, the, the recycling companies wants to make this distinction uh, between uh, I mean, it's a different word in Turkish. And in English, I don't know how much of this distinction is kind of the, 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 the consciously being used or if, or if there are any alternatives are. to it. And uh, if, you change our if you change your vocabulary from waste to garbage or rubbish, uh, and I, I don't know if in French you have déchet, I don't know if you have... A, uh, uh, kind of uh, how much of our uh, kind of conceptual uh, uh, framework will change? Yeah, this is the question. Maybe one more and then a quick one. <laughs> no pressure. This is a very complicated question. So, so if you don't understand, it's because I'm trying to be quick. Uh, uh, the question stems from the observations of the trash pickers and especially the last comment that you made about the complexities of their life and the alternative things that they do during their lives. Well, we work in southern Mexico. We work in a very large coffee plantation. And picking the coffee is very hard work. It's not, not, not at all like picking trash, obviously, but it's still very hard work. The people who pick the coffee there are, are temporary migrants from Guatemala. And recently, uh, a colleague of ours uh, did sort of work with them and did a whole bunch of interviews and. Uh, <clears throat> discovered that the attitude that the Guatemalan migrants have as they come to Mexico to pick the coffee is they actually love the work because most of, the, most, of the, most of their input, monetary input from the year comes from that one to two months period they're on the farm picking coffee. And that allows them to maintain their farms in Guatemala. They're all farmers in Guatemala and they probably would lose their farms if they didn't have that one month worth of salary that they had uh, in, in, that they have in Mexico. I was wondering if there's any sense amongst the trash pickers that there is that kind of security involved in the particular job of, pack, of trash picking for other aspects of their life. So maybe, Pauline, do you want to start this time? Oh, starting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess for Sasha, I don't know um, about Locke in particular, it's not my, my area of expertise, but I have been wondering recently about um, the role that translations of late 16th century uh, French agricultural treatises might have had on the sort of English conception of land, um, I guess. And so it's interesting that um, I wrote down the word, but now I'm forgetting. Um, at the beginning of <laughs> Vinay's talk, Right, that is the concept of improvement, isn't it? Around mm -hmm. Locke, yeah. Vinay, yeah. yeah. And so that's not a concept that I see in French um, at all about mm -hmm. the, the environment. Um, but in France, we don't have enclosure, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that um, the translator in English of one of those agricultural treatises uh, found in one of the chapters, found a way to put enclosure in there when it's not really the French concept itself. Um, so there's this application, but um, what's happening with those agricultural treatises is that they tend to be written by Protestant writers um, in France, 
And they tend to actually, and that's a problem for, I guess, my editor and the book project, but the last chapter, which is on these, has no waste in it, because as much as there is a growth of waste as a concern, as a phenomenon in, in, France, in French culture, I guess, at the, in that century, towards the end of the century, it kind of disappears, which is strange. But it maybe is reappropriated within these um, ways of thinking of land management um, that allow people to just not have waste and to just have a kind of moderate approach to um, what one of those authors called the philosophy of agriculture. Um, so that's, that was for you, but then for the question about um, le, the, the language, I guess, of waste, for me, waste is very convenient, and it's convenient that I'm writing my book in English, because in French, I wouldn't know which term to use, because waste has everything in it, um, and it, it's not déchet, so someone could have a poetic reading of déchet, the French word for garbage, as something that, f that, has, that is fallen. Um, but I, I like waste because it has everything. It has the, the wasting, the wastefulness, and it has the garbage itself. And um, but I think there are other words in French that are interesting, like glané, gleaning. Um, I think we all know Agnès Varda's mm -hmm. wonderful documentary. It's foundational to a lot of our work. So I would look outside, in fact, of, of those words of déchet or, or garbage, and I would look at other words that can um, invoke alternative ways of thinking about uh, the surplus or the leftover. Um, I'll pick up on on the um, the issue of, of wording. Um, so, in my own work and, and collaborative work uh, with uh, co-author um, Dr. Max de Baron, um, we talk about discard studies and differentiate discard from waste for a variety of reasons. Dis we go so far as to risk the proposition that any any system must discard in order to be the system that it is. And, um, but the journey from discard to waste is not automatic. It, it's possible, but not, not automatic. Discard could be pollution, it could be waste, it could be uh, dirt in the, the Mary Douglas sense of the term of, as a, an, an existential threat for us. Uh, the really crucial question um, that comes along with discarding, well, discarding is a technique of power, and so the question of power is crucial to think with, um, uh, struggles pertaining to politics, um, and, uh, or sorry, um, struggles pertaining to power, and, and power being about the creation and, and maintenance of unevennesses of various kinds, yeah. Hmm. Some of them we want. <laughs> um, great, I'll just quickly pick up the questions. So your question about, um, you know, lock and waste, and perhaps um, we need to think more concretely. I entirely agree. And, and one of the points I was trying to make, right, is in these two scenes from the waste value dialectic, I was trying to say, the first, you know, we think of waste as the external frontier. And then what happens, for instance, when industrial capitalism kind of strong, consolidates its hold, and we have both waste multiplying in quantity as well as in the seeing of waste and, and how to handle it. And there are all kinds of you know, debates around sanitation that also begin to emerge around right, this consolidation of industrial capital. I didn't go into that. Um, but I entirely agree with you right, that, uh, firstly, um, there is this, um, it's a dialectic, so it's, it's, it's dynamic. It's constantly shifting, right? And, and, and what gets put on the side of waste and what is able to be able to be recuperated into the domain of value is also constantly shifting. I mean, one way to think of waste um, is perhaps as anti-property and, and something that can you know, be rendered property, but perhaps refuses to be rendered property. Um, the, uh, and, and concrete historical instances, yes, I mean, I've done some of this in, in past work, but also J.M. Neeson has this great book called Commons and Commoners, where she you know, traces precisely this kind of heterogeneity of, of waste. Conceptual framing, um, I completely agree with you. I mean, I do have anxieties about using and invoking the concept of waste precisely because it's occupacious, and Josh, I think, points this out really well by making this distinction between waste and discards. And, you know, it, you, even within the English language, right, um, trash, garbage, rubbish, filth, residue, discard, and scrap are simply just some synonyms that sometimes, right, um, 
operate uh, in conjunction with waste. And of course, there's a you know little tradition of of scrappers, right, mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. um, which people have written about in very evocative ways, and particularly during economic downturns. Um, scrapping, particularly in the Rust Belt here, right, has been a very vital form of uh, generating uh, livelihoods and incomes. Um, in, in Hindi, um, I think the question, the vernacular, I mean, I can think again of a lexicon for, you know, which roughly is waste, but not quite, in the same way that Josh was enacting this distinction. Kura, kabar, kachra, gandagi, bekar, you know, they kind of connote not quite the same thing, but they also have, you know, um, some resonances with each other. Um, something is filth, something is, is dirt, something is superfluity, um, something is crap, something is garbage, but they have some kind of uh, shared ground, if you will. And in terms of the security of trash picking, you know, I've, I've been doing this work also uh, because a lot of waste pickers are migrants. Um, and and uh, the waste picking economies uh, absolutely support rural economies. So the remittances from uh, waste picking often um, enable um, cultivation to be an ongoing proposition, right, in, in many of these rural areas. And there are all kinds of intricate connections, including, you know, the interesting fact that often when waste pickers will um, leave uh, for their village um, to uh, attend to an emergency, um, they are able, through some kind of informal compact between waste pickers, um, re re regain their territory, their routes, when they return. Right. So, just, yeah. Thank you. Everyone join me in thanking our panel.